Ah, good morning. This is Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. We're talking to Rabbi Itchel Krasn Jansky today of Chabad of Hawaii to catch up with him. And I want to say it's an, an odd day because the news is that COVID is on the rise and also the stock market is on the fall. <laughs> Those two things seem to go hand in hand. Anyway, welcome to the show, Rabbi. Nice to see your smiling face. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here as always. And uh, yes, the market is down today and there's and, and it's sad to hear that there's a spike in the numbers. Yeah. And let's hope tomorrow's a better day. Yeah, agreed. So, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk to you and learn something about tissue bomb. It's coming up in July. And my, my limited reading on it is that it's not a happy holiday. It's a fasting day. Uh, and it's a day of, uh, of sadness, but I don't know really why. Can you talk about it? Sure. So Tisha B'Av actually, uh, which this year, correct, falls out on July 30th, the end of July, uh, is actually the saddest day of the year in the Jewish calendar. Because this is a day that marks many, many tragedies that happened to the Jewish people throughout our history. The, the, the uh, biggest of the tragedies are that on this day, uh, the temple was destroyed first by the Babylonians and then 400 years later or so by the Romans. And they were both on the same day, on the, on the day of Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is in Hebrew the ninth day of the month of Av. So it's a day of fasting, a day of mourning. And um, it is like everything else in Judaism. It is a lot deeper once you get into it than what it appears to be on the surface. Firstly, um, going all the way back to the Torah, the Bible, uh, we, we read in the Torah uh, about the Jewish people um, after they left Egypt, they um, were meant to go into Israel. They were meant to go from Egypt to Israel via the Sinai Desert. And right before, uh, before they were uh, to enter Israel, they had to strategize how to conquer the land because there were many nations that were living there, the Canaanites for one nation. Uh, and so the Torah tells us that Moses sends uh, 12 messengers, 12 spies, because they had to do some spying, uh, the heads of each of the tribes. There were 12 tribes amongst the Jewish people that comprised the Jewish nation. So Moses sent 12, 12 members, each member from a different tribe, different tribe, to, to, on a reconnaissance mission, to go and to look into look at the land and come back with a report how to conquer the land. However, they came back, and and in addition to delivering the report that they gave, they also injected their opinion, and they said that it's not possible to conquer the land. This is uh, a land that's populated by very a very very powerful nations. They're much stronger than us. They're giants. We're midgets. We're small, and uh, we cannot we we cannot uh, win this one. So uh, the whole nation went into the spear because they were in the desert. The desert is not a place to live. The desert is a very inhospitable place. The desert was only meant to be uh, a stepping ground to get them to Israel as quickly as possible. But now that they heard that uh, there, is, there are no uh, realistic chances for them to enter into the land and conquer the land, they fell into the spear. And, um, and God appeared to Moses and said that, that the, the, the spear is unwarranted and the weeping and the crying is unwarranted. Um, and basically, you know, if God says to do it, it can be done. However, uh, 
because they, they, they lack the faith and trust in, 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 in God and in, in, in Moses. So the 40 days that uh, it took the, these spies to go and come back uh, turned into a decree from God that that generation uh, would wander for 40 years in the desert for every day that they, would, that they failed, every day of the failed mission was another year and that entire generation would die out in the desert it would only be their children that would uh, enter into the land of israel and conquer the land of israel and the torah tells us that when did this happen this happened on tisha b'av on the ninth day of of so god said this is what the talmud tells us god said that you're that the, the, you're weeping for nothing because I'm about to enter you into a, a, a wonderful land, a land filled with milk flows flowing with milk and honey, which is a metaphor for all the blessings that are in Israel. But you're rejecting it, and as a result of that, this day, the day of Tisha B'av, will always be a dark day in your history. A day when would warrant real weeping for real for, 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 for good causes, for real for real tragedies. So the day of Tishabov has been marked as a day of tragedy. And uh, the two uh, big, big tragic things are the destruction of both of the temples uh, in, 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 the, in, in Jerusalem. But also many other uh, uh, large-scale tragedies happen to the Jewish people on this day. Uh, the Spanish, uh, the expulsion of the Spanish Jews in 1492, when the Jewish people were expelled from Spain. Um, That's part of the Inquisition. Part of the Inquisition. The decree came out on Tisha B'av. That was the day when all Jews had to either convert to Christianity or leave. And most chose to leave. And that was a very, very, very uh, difficult time because many people did not survive the long trek and, uh, and it was a disruption of, of, generations, of generations of life in those countries. More recently in our, uh, in, in bringing it closer to home, two things happened on Tisha B'Av that are very significant. One is World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, broke out on Tisha B'Av, on the corresponding day uh, of the Hebrew calendar of Tisha B'Av. And World War I really uh, was the first uh, salvo in the, in the undoing of the world order that existed up until then, which ultimately led to World War II, which led to uh, the Holocaust, so it all traces itself back to Tisha B'Av. And then even more recently than that, in Israel, in the land of Israel, uh, uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon uh, uh, decided to uh, give Gaza to the Palestinians as a gesture of peace and uh, by force, uh, vacated uh, uh, tens of thousands of Jewish people that were living on the Gaza Strip, and, and this was home for them. And they turned that that that, that desert, and that strip of land, into oasis of farming and 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 everything else. And that uh, so the day that this the evacuation, the forced evacuation, took place was on Tisha B'Av. Mm. And we all know, especially with the benefit of hindsight, that, that was a colossal, colossal mistake. A, it did not achieve uh, the, the goal of bringing peace. The, uh, the, you know, the, immediately the Palestinians moved in and Hamas took over and it became a launching pad for uh, terrorism to the state of Israel. And in addition to uh, them, within 24 hours of receiving uh, the land back, they went on uh, a protest riot, maybe not unsimilar to what we're seeing today, looting and destroying 
all the greenhouses, the factories that the Jewish people left for them, the Israeli people, Jewish people left for them in Gaza, uh, were, were destroyed. So that was another sad day. Now, so, so that's just the history, that's the context of Tisha B'Av. So like I said, it's a day of fasting, a 24-hour fast. There's only two days in the Jewish calendar that there are 24-hour fasts. One is Yom Kippur, and the other day is Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. <clears throat> so, so aside from fasting, uh, what is a... Uh, you know, what does a uh, uh, practicing Jew do on Tisha B'Av? It sounds like what he should do is to stay in bed and pull, <laughs> the, and pull the covers over his head. <laughs> well, actually, the very opposite is what happens. So first of all, there's a lot of praying going on in the synagogue. There's, many, there's a lot of prayer. It's called, <clears throat> it's called lamentations. We read from the, from the prophet Jeremiah, who prophesies the destruction. Uh, we read different uh, prayers that bemoan uh, the fate of the Jewish people and describe the tragedy of the destruction of the temples. But in, in the larger sense, and this is where the deeper understanding of, of, of Tisha B'Av comes in, the Torah teaches us that uh, that that there are only two things. There's things that are openly and revealed good, that we can see it, touch it, feel it, appreciate it, understand it. Then you have hidden good. Then you have things that seem to be bad, um, and the good is hidden. It's not seen. It's not apparent. You have to dig very deep, and you have to uh, 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 find the good in the bad the light in the darkness. And it seems to be that this is the, 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 like the, the, the motif, the, 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 the long-running motif of all of Judaism and perhaps all of life, all of life in general, that uh, the Torah teaches us, for example, that the destruction of the temples and the subsequent diaspora uh, was tragic and it was a, a quote unquote a negative event, but it actually opened up the door and it was part of God's plan to scatter the Jewish people to all, to all four corners of the world, us here in Hawaii, uh, for a divine purpose, a divine mission, which is to carry forth the, the, the role as the prophets uh, articulated for the Jewish people which is to be a light unto the nations. So sitting in, if we had been in Israel, in the Holy Land of Israel, all the Jewish people, it would have been very, very hard. Well, let me, let me ask you a question, Rabbi. You know, we, we have talked, you and I have talked, and, and people have talked, and it's, it's, it's in the conversation about uh, the temples and the destruction of the temples. This is, um, you know, it happened on, what, on two occasions, and... Um, it had a profound effect on the Jewish people and Judaism and, and the history of the Jewish people in, in the world. Um, but but why why did they why did the Jewish people just leave town? Why did they go on the diaspora? Why didn't they stay around? Why didn't they build a third temple? And how important is a temple anyway? Uh, you know, it seems like we've gotten along without one for a long time, um, we, and we seem to have done okay without one. So what was so important about it, and why didn't we pursue that? Wow, that's a lot of questions uh, <laughs> rolled into one question. So first of all, about the importance of the temple, okay? The temple was not just a, 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 a big structure where the Jewish people gathered to pray and to bring sacrifices and, uh, as it was in the biblical times. But the temple was the epicenter of, of, of Jewish life because in the temple, that's where God and godliness was revealed in a very palatable way. Today, when we look today in the diaspora, 
the world doesn't point to God. As a matter of fact, you have many people that deny that God exists, or if he exists, uh, he's only like a, you know a, a, a minority partner in life. You know, we're the ones that have to carry the rain, and God, you know, God, you know, maybe is at best is our conscience that tries to you know whisper to us, you know, to be good and to to be your best, etc. But but to recognize that God is not in the, ba in, the in the background, but God actually uh, not only created the world, but uh, but but uh, but sustains the world, and everything that happens uh, is directed by God. Um, is something that uh, today, you know, the reality doesn't point to that. The only way to recognize that is through deep contemplation and Torah study. And, and maybe if you go through life long enough, you come to realize that things are not as they appear to be. And, um, you know, and while, you know, we seem to, uh, to be in control or we feel, we think we, we are in control and then uh, a, a, a virus comes along, <laughs> And uh, and very quickly shows us that we have no understanding and no control, uh, not only of, uh, of of the big things, but even the small things. So uh, that's what the temple represented. The temple represented a, a manifestation of God and the truth that today is only in the books. When you look into the books, then you can study. You can you can arrive at that realization but if you look out your window and in your day-to-day -day life we don't experience that we don't sense that so the, that's a, that's so, a very profound transition yeah. <clears throat> instead of the physical temple it's the books it's conceptual and maybe that explains i mean uh, I, I i still would like your your answer on this, but maybe that explains why the Jewish people have never attempted to build a third temple. That's why, I mean, they certainly could have, they could in Israel, you know, in modern times, but they haven't. And, and it sounds like Judaism and the whole notion of the temple has, has been sort of translated into, into the religion as it exists in the books. Am I right? Well, well uh, yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, but actually, I, I, I would point out something else, something positive that came from this negative tragedy and something that uh, explains or perhaps gives us a little, little insight into God's master plan. So one of the basic principles in Judaism is that God is the essence of goodness. So everything that emanates from God uh, is good. And if it doesn't appear to be good, as we mentioned before, that means you just have to dig deeper and, and, and hopefully we can understand the good with the good in it. Some things are beyond our understanding. Some tragedies and some uh, setbacks are beyond our understanding. But no, we have to we have to try to find the light. We have exactly. to we have to make something of it. We have to make some analysis to give us some comfort that this is a true thing, that that in in, in everything there is the light. So right. my question, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to dance too much around outside of what you're discussing, but um, here we have COVID. COVID is killing hundreds of thousands of people. It will kill a lot more people. Uh, it will just, you know, disturb. It is disturbing, disrupting the world. Where, where's the good? This is like asking about the Holocaust, you know? Where's exactly. the good when so exactly. many people are being killed? Can you find good in these things? And how does it appear to you? And um, how can you, you know, fully appreciate, integrate that? So, so that's a very, 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 very important question. And like all important questions, there's no simple answers or no quick answers. And sometimes uh, if we don't have an answer, it's better because then we actually try to wrestle, we wrestle with the question. 
if we immediately get an answer, you go to Mr. Google and you get an answer, <laughs> so the question doesn't percolate enough in your mind and heart to, to really uh, plumb the depths of the question. So, so let's, let's sit with that question and let us all wrestle with it. Because when we do, we will actually come to a, a better understanding. So, so let me just say something about the Holocaust, and then I'll talk about what, I, what I've read and what I hear and what I feel and think about COVID-19. So first of all, even before I say about the Holocaust, questions like that really need to be addressed to the real big kahunas uh, within Judaism, like the Rebbe of blessed memory. That was the kind of thing that he would speak to because, you know, uh, the Rebbe, someone who was a spiritual giant, knows how to read the tea leaves, so to speak, in God's subtle uh, messages. Uh, it, it's been explained, it's, it's been, uh, um, it's been explained the whole idea of you know God sending us messages. So it's explained with this with the analogy of a father or a mother, a parent who takes their young child out in the evening, wanting to show this young child the, the magnificent stars in the heaven, like here in Hawaii, the beauty, the beautiful you know star star skies that we see almost every night. So the parent takes the young child out and points with their finger uh, to, the, to the sky, wanting the child to see the stars. But the young child, who's so young and doesn't understand, is fixated on the finger, is looking up to the finger, without realizing that the finger is pointing to where the parent wants him to look. So we're looking at God's fingers. Whatever God sends our way is like God pointing to us. But we, not, not understanding, we just get fixated on the finger on what's happening and, 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 and don't even contemplate what it, where, where is God pointing? What does he want us to see that we're not seeing? So in the Holocaust, uh, there are two, two questions uh, that... that, that the world, particularly the Jewish people, were grappling with right after the Holocaust. One was, what does that say about God? Uh, if God is all merciful and all powerful and a good God, how can he allow for such tragedy to happen? That was a question that, frankly, many, many people lost their faith in God, you know, uh, as a result of the Holocaust, especially those who lived through it. And uh, for other people, interestingly enough, it actually deepened their faith in God. If you, if you read or if you've spoken to Holocaust survivors, some of them actually came away with a deeper uh, faith in God. So, that, so let's leave that aside now. That's a, a very deep theological discussion. But the Holocaust also had a lot to say about man and civilization and society. How can a whole entire nation turn into barbaric murderers? How could the world, the whole civilized world, turn a blind eye to such human suffering? That tells you a lot about, about civilization. Many people lost faith in man and lost faith in civilization. So these are the things when we talk about, you know, like you said, so what, what, what's the takeaway from uh, a tragedy like that? In reference to COVID-19 and in reference to the, the, the destruction of the temples, <clears throat> so the, the, once the temple was destroyed, the epicenter of Jewish life was moved to the Jewish, into the Jewish home. And that actually had a very, very, very profound uh, positive effect because now it wasn't, you know, uh, going to the synagogue, going to the temple to speak to God, you had to, you had to find God within your home, within yourself. And that's really the secret of Jewish survival, how over the millennia, you know, with all the persecutions, Jews were able to survive because it was, it was God in their hearts and in their homes that 
kept them uh, kept them shining bright. That's in reference to the destruction of the temples, and in a very similar way, I believe, is is the takeaway from what we're experiencing now with COVID nineteen. Also, the temples have been closed, all the synagogues have been closed, and everything is happening in the house, in the home, and in the home is really where you're where where you show your true colors. You know, when we walk out, we wear different hats and different uh, masks today, uh, literally and figuratively. But at home, we are ourselves, who we are. So the message, you know, we, God is sending us home, saying now, you know, be who you truly are. Be the good that you, that, the person that you are. Be it at home, in your relationship with your wife and your family, even in your relationship vis-a-vis yourself. And, and yes, and we've been forced to, uh, you know, to experience this. You know, maybe on our own, we wouldn't choose to focus, you know, on the deepest levels of who we are and how we are, stuff like that. So that's made perhaps one good that could come out of it. Obviously, the, the death and the, the, you know, people dying is uh, an illness is, is not something that... Um, we can understand how good, why, why that is good and how that is good. But, um, you know, that's, that's where faith kicks in. Faith uh, begins where reason ends. You can only go so far, you know, with, with the mind, even though the, mount, the mind is a very powerful tool and we use our mind to guide us and, to, and, and that's really the engine of our being and, and our guide. But... And so, sometimes the mind uh, can only go so far. And what happens when, when, when you can't go any further? That's where faith kicks in, which means you surrender, <laughs> to, a higher, you surrender to a higher being, a higher authority. And well, so, so, you know, taking all that, though, uh, this has really been a, a great discussion. I, I, I so appreciate your thoughts on all of these yeah. things. Um, but taking all of that, Rabbi, here we are in a time when we have an uncontrolled pandemic, um, which means a lot more people will die. Um, we, have, uh, we have racial strife um, and uh, racism in this country. Um, we have uh, an economy which is in, you know, arguably in trouble and arguably in freefall, uh, which is going to affect us, all of us. Uh, we, we, this is not the best of times. Um, and so I ask you, you know, to pull from that here and, uh, you know, on, on the way to Tisha B'Av, um, your advice to us. Uh, how do we handle a world that seems to be on fire? How do we uh, handle a world that, that, um, that has only lamentable things coming? Uh, how do we see that? How do we deal with it? Well, what I would say is two things. Number one, I think we each have to know that we could be part of the solution and not to throw up our hands and say, what can we do? That, that God has endowed each and every one of us <clears throat> with seichel, with intellect, and, uh, and, and if we have good intentions, we actually could do a lot of good and um, to fix things. And sometimes when things are really broken, that's the best time to come in and fix. You know, when you look at a house that's okay, um, it's harder to imagine tearing it down and building a nicer house. But if the house is in tatters and it's all broken up, it's very easy to recognize and very easy to tear it down and to build and to rebuild stronger. So I think this is almost like an invitation and, you know, and almost like God knocking on our door and saying, okay, come, come with your best abilities and fix all of these issues that seem to be bringing us down and tearing us apart, whether it's what's happening now in America with the race riots, address that issue and actually the Rebbe in his, in his, in his wisdom talked about these things uh, many, many, many times. And it has a lot to do with faith in God. 
we live in a society that's pretty much taken God out of the picture. God has been expelled from the schools, as, as Reagan uh, once said. You can't teach about God in the schools. It's, God is not part of our lives. And, and the result of that is really, uh, uh, is, is really what's happening today. I mean, it requires another conversation for us, you know, to maybe we should talk about it. What, is the, what does the Torah have to say about the issues of the day, of today? And how, how, what kind of guidance can the Torah give us to heal our society? And oh. uh, Great, great questions. Questions we do have to address that would be uh, so, so important to have your answers on those questions. So I'm, I'm looking forward, Rabbi, to our next time. Uh, when we can address this and put it in perspective, I hope things are not that much worse the next time. Um, but I, but I fear um, things will not be that much better either. So um, let hold those thoughts, okay? And we'll come back and talk to you in a few weeks. And uh, by the get way, your uh, advice and counsel, Jay. Uh, just uh, just like to conclude it with a joke. You just reminded me of a, of a good. Jewish joke. Uh, what is the definition of uh, a Jewish optimist? So the pessimist says it can get worse, cannot get worse. But the optimist, the Jewish optimist says, what are you talking about? For sure it'll get worse. <laughs> <laughs> the Rabbi Itchel Krasinjansky, the leader of Chabad of Hawaii. Thank you so much. And also for the joke. <laughs> Alo Aloha. Thank you, Jay.